What's up, you guys? Welcome to Walk the Line. We're talking UFC 308 today. This is a fight card that's been on my radar for quite some time. I'm super ecstatic about this main event between Ilya Taporia and Max Holloway. The featherweight championship of the world is on the line. Not sure why the BMF title is not officially on the line. I think some people are saying that Taporia is not BMF eligible, which is complete blasphemy. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, Taporia is BMF all day. And when you're talking to Poria, you're talking about the best boxing in the sport of MMA, in my opinion, okay? Uh, his boxing is as clean as it gets. Now, I will say this, Max Holloway is probably in my top five as far as his boxing skills in this sport. So it's going to be a great test for Taporia. We'll see if he's able to go out there and put on another clinic. And a lot of people felt that Taporia uh, was a fighter that had a little bit of a padded record, right? He's still undefeated, uh, but leading up to that Volkanovski fight, people weren't crazy about the level of competition. Uh, you go out there and you knock out Volkanovski the way he did. Obviously, that will shut some of those guys up. He follows that victory with a victory here over Max Holloway. Those people completely dissipate. You're talking about back-to-back -back victories over potentially the top two featherweights of all time. Uh, 1A, 1B, however your list is. And, and comment below, what is your list? As far as the greatest featherweight of all time goes, you got to throw Jose Aldo in the mix of that that top three, top four. Whether you love him or hate him, Conor McGregor's towards the top as well. Maybe he's a little bit below some of these guys as far as the proven track record. He never really defended the title, but when he was doing his thing, when he grabbed that title, he was on an absolute tear. Um, I would love to know your guys' thoughts there. I will tell you this. I think that Ilya Taporia, when it's all said and done, will be at the top of the list. All right, guys, if you didn't know, I'm a big Taporia fan. Uh, I, I've always been a huge Conor McGregor fan, and I think that Ilya Taporia has a lot of the, the early vibes of McGregor when he was going out there delivering on his talk, and I think that he's super slick on the mic. And I know not everyone's really going to agree with me there. Some people don't like his, his confidence or his cockiness. I do like that. I like when fighters are uh, sharp on the mic. They're cocky. They're super confident in, in themselves. I like that, that demeanor that he carries into the cage because he backs it up as well. So you guys can let me know if you're a fan of his also below i'm sure some of you guys are not really feeling uh his his energy we saw the recent interview or or uh, whatever you want to call it the debate between him and, and uh, max holloway and they were going back and forth and max holloway has a very chill vibe and i love me some max holloway as well let me be clear there but taporia is more my type of guy I like a guy that goes out there and uh, really calls his shot and, and mixes the pot up. You guys know I like some bad blood. I like some beef and all that type of stuff. So uh, we, we got that going into this fight. As you guys can tell, I'm very excited and I'm going on and on about it. But uh, we will get to that fight. We will cap this video off with a prediction and a full breakdown of that main event. Other than that, though, we got Robert Whitaker taking on Kamzat Chimaev. If Chimaev shows up, looks like all signs are pointing that he will uh, show up. And uh, I can't wait to talk about that one either. But major implications for the future of the middleweight division. I'm letting you guys know right now, if one of these fighters goes out there and makes a huge statement with the big time finish, do not be surprised if they're fighting for the title next. Do not be surprised if they surpass Sean Strickland on Strickland getting that rematch, even though a lot of people thought Strickland won that first fight against DDP and he went out there and got a win over Costa. He hasn't been finishing fights, whether you, whether you want to admit it or not. I'm a Strickland fan, but he hasn't been going out there and really delivering. If Robert Whitaker goes out here and gets another knockout, Right, following up the performance that he just had where he uh, flew out across the world and got another big knockout. Okay, he, he has the train back on the tracks. He's a former champ and he could be fighting for the title next. And obviously, if Chumayev goes out there and, and performs, he has the name. If he could stay healthy and active, he could be fighting for the belt. So major implications for the future of the division. And then besides that, the cards just overall stack, but I have to highlight Magomed and Goliath versus Alexander Rakic because you guys know I do feel, I do believe that Magomed and Goliath is the number one light heavyweight fighter on planet earth and time will tell. And I love me some Alex Pajeda as well, but I, I just believe Enka Live is the more complete fighter. And I think that he will get the better of Pajeda when we finally get to see those two men locked in a cage. And uh, I know some of you guys may disagree with me there. I'm throwing out some, uh, some controversial statements on the mic. So we're stirring the pot up just how I like these fighters to stir the pot up. I'm stirring the pot up. And uh, you know, we had a long intro here. I would love to dive into some of the some of these other fights, but we'll just get into it as this video uh, progresses. But there, there's exciting fights for, from the early prelims all all the way up to the main card. So uh, just note this, guys. If you want to work with me for my official plays, I'm going to have some huge action on this card. Do not hesitate to reach out to me, whether it's on IG, Twitter, or shoot me an email. I'm on Instagram at MMA Fortune Teller underscore. I'm on Twitter at the MMA Teller. Shoot me a DM or email me. It's scrolling below. 
And I'm going to put out a special offer for you guys. If anyone's interested, hit the comment section up below. Give me three winners for this fight card. Give me the method of victory, whether it's KO, submission, or decision. If it's KO or sub, you do have to give me the round that that finish will occur in. If you get all three correct, I will give you guys a full one-month package for my official plays, okay? That's a great value there. Not just one card like I typically do on, on Instagram. I'll throw this offer out there. If you guys get all three correct, I will give you a one-month package free, okay? So some, some great value. Hit the comment section up below. And then the last thing, guys, a special shout-out to BetUS. We are powered by BetUS. If you guys are looking to sign up to a new sports book, reach out to me. I'll give you my referral link to BetUS, and you're going to get a 150% match on your first three deposits there's no other sports books that are giving that type of deposit match on, on your first three, not even just your first, your first three deposits there, guys. Take advantage of that. Reach out to me so I can give you that link and I'll give you a special gift as well. If you sign up through my link, I'll give you a special gift. Reach out to me, guys. All right, let's jump in to this card. The teller, the teller, the teller, the teller, the So this is the third opponent that Kennedy and Shekou has been scheduled to fight on the date. Uh, he's now taking on Chris Barnett. Initially, he was supposed to be taking on Marcos Rogerio de Lima. Then he was supposed to be taking on Justin Taffa, who just pulled out recently. Uh, in steps, Chris Barnett. What's interesting about this fight is Chris Barnett was supposed to be fighting Junior Taffa, the brother of Justin Taffa. Barnett had to withdraw due to that, that huge hurricane that hit the west coast of Florida. Barnett from the Tampa area. Uh, hopefully everything's good with him, but it seems that he, he's all ready to go and he's going to be taking the trip out to Abu Dhabi. Uh, now, I would say that Chris Barnett is definitely a step down in competition compared to the first two opponents that Kennedy was scheduled to fight. So uh, I, I think he should be feeling good with this matchup here. If you guys remember, I did pick Chris Barnett uh, to defeat Junior Taffa. And if any of you guys think that I was I was off on that pick, I know we didn't get to see that fight take place because Barnett pulled out. But look at the performance that Junior Taffa had once again. He was seconds from losing that fight in the first round. Seconds. If it wasn't for the bell, he was going to get finished at the end of the first round. Uh, but by the UFC newcomer who took that fight on short notice, Sean Sharef, the fighter we're talking about there, give him a little bit of credit uh, for that performance. But the point being is that Chris Barnett, in my opinion, could have won that fight. This is a completely different type of affair, though. This is a different type of matchup. I don't think uh, Chris Barnett will have nearly as much of a chance uh, to pull off the big underdog upset here. One issue that Beast Boy is going to have here is I don't see himself falling into a sloppy TKO victory like he could have done against Tafa or like he has done against Jean Vellante and Jay Collier. Kennedy and Sheku is a fighter that has showcased an 80% takedown defensive rate. He's not an easy fighter to get down there. And even if he, he did somehow get him down early on in the fight, Kennedy has also shown growth growth in his overall game, and I can see himself working his way back up to the feet where he eventually will take this fight over with his striking. I mean, look at the massive reach advantage that he brings into this matchup here. Uh, he will have uh, about an eight-inch reach advantage. He's much taller, and I could really see him teeing off on Barnett from range. Uh, besides that, we also have to remember Barnett hasn't been in the, in the octagon for over two years. He's 38 years old now. We already talked about some of the distractions that he might have going on outside the cage. And now you got Kennedy and Sheku coming into this fight on a two-fight losing skid. We know he got knocked out by Dustin Jacoby. And he has shown to be a little below average at times as far as, as his defense goes on the feet. He will try to rely on his chin and he'll absorb a lot of strikes to kind of walk you down and push the pace on you. He's absorbing 4.9 strikes per minute, which is a little bit... Uh, you know, above the mean that that could be an issue here if he runs into a huge shot by Barnett early on. But I will say this, even though Jacoby got that knockout on him over the long haul, he has shown to have a very durable chin. We've seen him walk through a lot of damage. That's how he pulled off that Carlos Olberg victory, took a lot of damage and then broke Olberg down. I could see him weathering the storm from anything that Barnett's going to throw his way early on. And then just, he's going to take this fight over. Uh, yeah, he is coming off a loss against OSP. He was a huge favorite in that fight. He dropped the ball. I think that just makes him that much more dangerous going into this fight. He's going to be extremely motivated. And I just see this fight being Kennedy's all day. I'll cut to the chase here. I think that Kennedy can also get Chris Barnett out of there. Bar Barnett is a fighter that has gassed uh, quite often when he's in the cage. He's just older now. He hasn't been in there. He hasn't been active. You got to think that he probably breaks down in the later rounds and Kennedy can get him out of there. I'm going to take Kennedy to win this fight via TKO. 
I think he finds himself in an opportunist type of position where he could just rain down those shots and the referee jumps in and stops the fight. Now, when it comes to the betting line, I do not have a line on this fight as it was just announced. Uh, I'm going to say that Kennedy is going to open or, or even settle around a five to a six to one favorite. Maybe I'm off there. I think he should be a, a big time favorite going into this fight. Maybe it's a little lower. Maybe it's in the minus 400 range, but I expect Kennedy to be a big time favorite. Maybe it's something you want to mix in to a parlay. There's that type of potential. Uh, but I, I think that he gets him out of there. I think he gets to finish. So listen, guys, I will 100% be doing a prop edition video for this fight card. When we got big fight cards like this taking place, I will 100% do a prop edition video. So we'll talk about maybe a, a finished prop for Kennedy, maybe a TKO prop there. Just note that I know I haven't been doing them as much recently, but for the big cards, you will always see them. And I'm curious to see where this line opens and closes at, but I have it somewhere around that four to six to one type of range for Kennedy. Now, this is going to be a fun one taking place in the bantamweight division. We have Syed Nurmagomedov taking on Willie Cat, Daniel Santos. Daniel Santos, a straight up typical shoot box fighter. If you break down his tape, you watch some of his recent fights, you may think you're watching Charles Oliveira in there uh, with the bleach blonde hair and all that. I mean, he, he seriously moves so similar. You know that shoot box runs a tight ship because all, all the guys, they move so similar. I mean, they, they have that, that system down pack over there. And Daniel Santos has had some success, man. He's coming into this fight on a two-fight winning streak. The fight that he had with John Castaneda, where he got his first ever UFC victory, that was a big one. He faced a lot of early adversity in that fight. He was almost finished in the first round. Uh, he dug deep and then eventually got his own finish there in the second round. It was just like one of those performances by Charles Oliveira uh, in the later half of his career where he took that early damage and then pushed through it and got his own finish. Uh, not like the Charles once upon a time when he was a young kid where he used to crumple up into a ball and be finished. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about there. All right. He has that, that recent Oliveira uh, type of vibes with him that he brings into the cage. Uh, let's understand that Nurmagomedov is a different type of fighter uh, compared to the recent men that Santos has been in there with. Okay. He's a, a step above a Johnny Munoz or John Castaneda. Nurm Nurmagomedov, I'll say this. I don't want to say he's an underrated fighter, but if he didn't take that early L to Hione Barcelos, who at the time was very talented and hitting on all cylinders. Barcelos really fell off a cliff, but when he was younger, man, he was one of the, the top guys in this division from a talent standpoint. Okay, if he didn't take that early L, and if he didn't, in my opinion, just get robbed by Jonathan Martinez, and a robbery may be a strong term because that was somewhat of a close fight, but note that 80%, 80 to 90% of all the media scored that fight for Nurmagomedov just as I did. I thought that he took that fight if he would have had that win, which he de then followed up with that quick guillotine choke over uh, Gafarov, which that, that's a move that Nurm Nurmagomedov will go to, man. That guillotine is nasty. It's almost on the level uh, of the MMA fortune teller. So you have to note that too. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that guillotine here in a second. But if Nurm Nurmagomedov didn't have those situations go down, I mean, this is a fighter that would be at the top of the heap in this division. He may be fighting for a belt at this point in time with the win streak like that. He's a very dangerous fighter. He's not your typical Dagestani MMA fighter. He's not a fighter that relies heavily on his grappling. Remember, there was all this, this talk about him when he came into the UFC, right? He's a fighter that's very flexible. He has this dangerous uh, kicking attack that he brings into the game, similar to uh, Zabitz, which he used to train a lot with both of them. Went over to Mark Henry's gym over there in New Jersey and got a lot of work in early on. And uh, there was all these comparisons between the two uh, of Zab Zabit and uh, Syed Nurmagomedov here. And that's what he brings into the cage, man. He's hard to hit. Okay, I think that Daniel Santos may have a hard time finding him. He's only, Syed's only absorbed 2.13 strikes per minute, man. He fights uh, at range. He uses almost like a karate type of style, and he will inflict his damage from the outside. And I think that Santos will be in danger of running into a strike as well. Where you got to be careful is if this fight gets ugly and it becomes a firefight, that is the type of scenario that Daniel Santos thrives in. And Syed wouldn't be in as good of a position compared to if he was fighting from the outside, okay? There's a potential he can get a clip with the shot. We've also seen him take take rounds off at times. I think that's the reason why that Jonathan Martinez fight played out a little closer than it should have. You saw him kind of slow down a little bit in the middle part of that fight, but I also did think that he picked it back up late in that fight, so showing a little growth there. But if this fight gets ugly, maybe Santos can put himself in a position uh, where he gets the better of Nurmagomedov later in the fight. Um, now, as far as... Either man getting a finish, we've never seen either of them be finished. So understand that they're both very durable 
And as this fight goes to the judges' scorecards, which is what I expect to see, I think that Nurmagomedov should be inflicting more damage and just being a little bit cleaner out there. Uh, one little side note, if we do see a finish, not only could it be maybe a counter KO from Nur Nurmagomedov, who's very slick with the kicks, he can land a head kick in this fight. We've seen him land a lot of head kicks uh, throughout his early UFC career and, and, and throughout it. Uh, and Santos is there to be hit, like we talked about in that Castaneda fight where he took a head kick, got wobbled, and was almost finished. Even though he's never been finished, we've seen him take damage in the cage. That is a possibility. But there's also a possibility that Nurmagomedov can slap on that guillotine choke because he's one of the best in the game with that choke. I really believe that. The way he goes out there and just slaps that on, uh, like he did in his last fight against Gafarov, the way he did against Kokrakmanov, who's, who's an underrated fighter, caught that in the second round. Uh, we saw him do it to Cody Stamen in just 47 seconds. Okay, he's a threat early on in his fights with that sub. And um, that that is a choke that you have to keep an eye on, especially if Santos were to try to change levels, but I don't really expect that. Uh, so if we see a finish in this fight, I do have Nurmagomedov being the fighter that lands that finish. Uh, but I'm a little hesitant to, to take him uh, by, by way of finish because Santos is just shown to be so tough, man, and just to push through adversity in the cage. I'm going to say that Nur Nurmagomedov wins a decision, but that, that finish is, is there. It, it could happen. Nurmagomedov is a minus 240 favorite right now on BetUS. Okay, so that, that line's slightly up there, uh, especially if you're someone that has respect for Willie Cat. All right, that, that may be a line that has you kind of scratching your head a bit. Uh, I'm kind of on the other side of the fence, though. I more respect what I've seen from Nur Nurmagomedov, and I think that he puts it all together over the next year, and you start to really see him make some noise in the top of this division. I don't see Willie Cat uh, being the fighter that has... Norma made of being in uh, an awkward situation like he was against Jonathan Martinez or Barcelos early on in his career. I think that this time things go a little bit more smoothly and we see Norma Gamadov get his hand raised at the end of the day. In the middleweight division, Bruno Silva welcomes back the Austrian wonder boy to the UFC. Ismail Nurdiov uh, getting a second chance here. If you guys forgot about him, when he first came into the UFC, he was just 23 years old, I believe. Had an excellent performance against Michelle Prezaris, who's a fighter that a lot of us had respect for. Okay, you take a look at the resume of Prezaris. He was a dangerous fighter, and he went out there as such a young fighter, making his UFC debut, and he performed. That was a very fun fight, and he showcased the striking that he possesses. That's his bread and butter. He's a very talented striker. Um, after that, though, you know, in, in the second fight in the UFC, he showed that he had some deficiencies in his game. It was kind of grinded out by a low-level fighter in Chance Reencounter, who had that wrestling background. Uh, bounced back with the victory after that. Then he lost to Sean Brady, who's one of the top fighters in the game, and the UFC cut ties with him. All right, since leaving the UFC, I believe he's now uh, one, two, three, four, and three since leaving the UFC. So it's not like he went out, he went out and just had all this this success, and then the UFC welcomed him back. Now he had some success; he's had some big wins, but he's taken his fair share of losses, like we said. Uh, got knocked out against Fadim Kutsi, who we just saw fight on Dana White's Contender Series, who didn't get the victory, but we saw. He's the real deal. He's a talented dude, okay? Kutsi's going to be back. Yeah, that, that guy's dangerous, and he got caught by Kutsi. He got knocked out in that fight, uh, but he just bounced back with a, a submission victory against Hadby. And I'll say this. I think that Nurdiov is a, is a fun fighter to watch. I think he's a dangerous fighter, and he has the potential to put things together here in this second stint and uh, maintain a UFC career. I'll say that, okay? He's just 28 years old. There's a lot of room for growth, and I think that he'll be a much more mature fighter. He's been involved in a lot of wars outside the UFC, and I think that will help him be more comfortable, and, and he's a more well-rounded fighter than he once upon a time was. And in this matchup, man, uh, he's not getting a layup in this return fight. Bruno Silva's no joke. Uh, Bruno Silva, 35 years old. He's coming off that very awkward fight against Chris Weidman, uh, and Weidman ended up getting the victory. There was all this eye poking going on and, and whatnot. Uh, two losses before that against high-level fighters and uh, Mega Madoff and Brendan Allen. Uh, before that, he had the knockout over Brad Tavares. Listen, I'll, I'll say this. I'm leaning towards uh, the Austrian Wonder Boy getting the victory here based on the fact that Silva does take a lot of damage. Okay, he, he walks in and, and he kind of tends to eat, eat strikes to land his own. And I, I think that Nurdiov can kind of outpoint him in this fight if he wants to but i do expect the pace to pick up and even in that type of scenario i still favor the overall striking of nerdyov i think he's very hungry here and i can see him landing in this fight uh, silva is just a fighter that just always eaten a lot of shots he's been absorbing 5.45 strikes per minute while only landing 4.12 that's always a bad sign whenever you see fighters absorbing significantly more than they're landing that's not a good sign no matter how you spin it and you have uh 
limited numbers to go off here in Nurdiev's first stint with the UFC, the fights we talked about, but still a decent ratio there, landing 3.17 compared to absorbing absorbing 1.3. He's shown to be somewhat uh, defensively skilled, although I, I think those numbers don't really point to who he is as a fighter. He'll look to involve himself in a war, and we talked about the recent knockout loss that he took, so there's a... Uh, there's potential that he can eat a big shot from Silva and be knocked out in this fight. There is that type of potential. Uh, Silva is a knockout artist. Um, all in all, though, I'm going to side with Nerdyov to come back to the UFC and get a decision victory. Uh, Bruno Silva's only been knocked out once before. He's a durable fighter. I just think that Nerdyov can outpoint him in, in this matchup here. All right, we take a look at the betting line. This is a, a pick em fight. Right now, Nurdyov is a very slight underdog. Can't even say he's an underdog. This is a pick'em fight. There's just a, a minuscule lean towards Silva's way uh, throughout the books right now. Uh, but pick your poison here. I'll say that Nurdyov puts it together this time around. It's just more diverse with his attack on the feet too. He'll mix in his kicks. He, he switches stances, and Silva has more of a boxing-oriented attack. And I think that Nurdyov kind of outpoints him. And we we talked about how Silva eats a lot of shots. So give me Nurdyov to bounce back with the victory in his his return fight, which will be a big one for him. We got the still undefeated Farid Basharat. Uh, he's the only Basharat in the UFC that could say that. As uh, unfortunately for Javid, his brother, he did take an L against Ayman Sahabi. And that was fortunately enough for us because we cashed in on one of the biggest dog plays that we've ever had. If you guys didn't know, we had a one unit play at plus 500 on Ayman Sahabi. Just got to highlight that real quick. Okay, both, bro both brothers, very talented. Uh, Farid will be taking on Victor Hugo here. Victor Hugo, if you guys remember, Victor Hugo was a fighter that he was going into his Dana White's contender series fight and we couldn't pull up any tape on him. He had all this mystique behind him. He has all these fights on his resume where we can't even find out the, the method of victory, these lower level fights over on the regional scene in Brazil. Uh, but then he, he comes into that fight on DWCS and he really performs. He pulls off this wild knee bar showing to be very tricky down on the mat. He followed that up with the victory in his UFC debut against the Nova Unia product and Pedro Falco. That was a fight where he actually showcased to have some striking ability. He's, he's a real athlete there. I wouldn't say he's the most polished striker, but he's a solid athlete that can hit you with some wild strikes. And he had success in that fight doing that as he outlanded the opposition 68 to 42 on the significant strike count. But what's interesting is, is when we're talking about his grappling and whatnot, he was actually controlled for over seven minutes in that fight. That's something you have to be careful about if you're siding with him in this fight because Basharat is a fighter that's very polish down on the mat okay so he, he'll get you down there and he'll control you down there all right he'll he'll sit in side control he'll sit in your half guard and he'll really hold you down there and good luck getting up he's just he's very polished and the same goes for his striking right it's not the most flashy but he, he can jab you up he, he can land on you there and he's just very technical not a lot of pop on his hands only one knock out of, out of 12 victories but he can outstrike you there don't don't get it twisted him and his brother javid have very polished striking um they'll just kind of outpace you there and then they're, they're sharp they're right down the pipe with their strikes and i could really see farid having success in that type of fight if it stays there but he also has to be to be wary and be careful from a a, a quick loopy uh wild type of strike from hugo if you guys know what i'm saying what, like an athletic type of strike that comes from way out east and west because hugo will throw the kitchen sink towards your head you got to be careful there he'll throw some spinning attacks towards your way too i think that basharat would be smart to change levels and try to ride out some some top control time. But even there, you got to be careful, man. We, we saw Hugo pull off that knee bar like we talked about, and, and it was tricky the way he pulled it off. So I think that there's a threat from Hugo no matter where this fight goes. And that's why I'm not in agreement with the betting line on this fight. For Rid Basharat's now minus 500, opened up as a minus 460 on BetUS, action coming in on him. I think people are disrespecting Hugo a little bit. I think that people just feel comfortable that Farid will fall into flow state, get on top of him, and just ride ride this fight out. But Hugo's dangerous, man. Hugo's a dangerous fighter. You, you could possibly argue maybe he's a, he's a little bit more of a mature fighter too at 31 years old with the 29 professional fights that he has compared to Farid's just 12, even though Farid's been in the UFC a little bit longer at this point in time. Um, I don't see a lot of value on Farid Basharat. And I actually think that Hugo is live to go out here and pull something wild off. I just think that he's that type of fighter. I think that he just lets it flow and you never know. He can, ca he can catch Farid with something. And don't forget when... Uh, Farid's brother, Javid, I know I, I was already talking about it because it's a, it's a pleasant memory, but you know, when you take a look at a line like this next to a Basharat's name, just understand that you can see the dog go out there and pull off the upset. Okay. And Javid was even uh, more of a favorite than Farid is here at the minus 500 line. I think that Javid was like 
a minus 700, minus 800. So the, the Basharat brothers get a lot of respect, and I just think you got to be a little wary there. Pump the brakes. The value is on the underdog, in my opinion. I will say that Farid most likely wins a decision in, in this fight, which is something uh, that he's he's been doing quite often as of recently, and I'll, I'll take him to win this fight by decision. How about this one here? Taking place in the lightweight division. I don't want to refer to either of these fighters as prospects because at this point in time, they've established themselves as legitimate fighters in the UFC, right? They've went out there and had some big time wins. Uh, Oral Bay is a fighter. And Miktabek Oral Bay taking on Mateus Rembeski here. Uh, Oral Bay took that fight against Euros Medic, his UFC debut fight. He took that on short notice, went out there. Uh, he was the underdog and he went out there and pulled off that neck crank against Euros Medic, who's one of the top fighters in the game right now, or top up and coming fighters in the division. But understand that Medic is lacking a little bit from, from the grappling side of things, right? He's more of a dangerous striker. So he was able to go out there and exploit him stylistically. He followed that up with the victory over Elvis Brenner. Do you guys remember the Brenner fight? That was a fight that Oral Bay was dominating in the first two rounds. And then the third round, Brenner took that third round. Brenner had him in somewhat of trouble. I don't know if we want to say trouble, but he had some success early in the third round. And you kind of were on the edge of your seat if you're back in Oral Bay. I say that much, okay? But Oral Bay... Uh, he, he got things together there. He took that unanimous decision, winning two of the three rounds there. Oral Bay is a ridiculously polished fighter for a 26-year-old. It's crazy when you think about the fact he's just 26. He's a baby boy. You may have thought that he was 5,000 and 26. You may have thought he was born in 3,000 BC or something like that. But no, he, he's a baby, man. 26. And he's just so polished. I, I would say it starts with his grappling. He doesn't give you an inch of space there. He can exploit you, like we said uh, he did against Medish. He can do that to you if you're not uh, up to par there. But also with his striking, he's, he's very polished there. Doesn't have the best athleticism or that, that one pop shot typically from what we've seen from him, even though the majority of his finishes are coming by way of KO. I would say in the octagon, we haven't seen that real flash on the feet, but he, he's quite technical and he'll, he'll box you up and he'll he'll use that to set up takedowns on you and, and he'll grind you out to a victory. Uh, or he'll eventually break you down and pull off a sub. And we'll see if he can start to get those KOs in the cage. Time will tell there. So which way am I going to go? If I haven't made it transparent, I have a lot of respect for the skill set both these men bring into the cage. And I really want to see how far they push it. I think that we will see numbers next to their names in this division down the line. And this could be a tough loss for Rebecki if he does lose this. He'll be on a two-fight losing skid. And he is 32 years old, but it's not that far up there in age. He'll have some time to get things back on track. But uh, this is a big fight for him. And I think he's going to be extremely motivated. I think that that loss that he took actually grounds him a little bit going into this fight. At times, he's a little bit overly aggressive and puts himself in vulnerable positions as he looks to uh, to smash the opposition and get his own finish. I think that he comes into this fight a little bit more grounded and he could use his grappling skills to stifle some of the takedown attacks from Oral Bay. There's a possibility of that. And he may be the better striker here, man. Fights out of that southpaw stance and he just... He wings those shots and he lands. He's accurate with them. I could see him potentially getting the better of some of those types of situations. And I'm really curious to see how this fight looks in the third round. Um, I think that Rebexi can potentially have success there as well. This is a great fight. I have a lot of respect for the threat that Oral Bay brings to the cage as well. So let me not just act like I'm overlooking him. But the point that I'm getting to is I think that this line's a little disrespectful to uh, the Polish Mateusz Rebecki. I think it's a little disrespectful. People are just down on him. His stock's extremely low based on the fact that he just got finished up in a fight where he was a massive favorite. Uh, if he shows up and he looks like the the vintage form of himself, this is a fight that is a lot more competitive than him being a plus 225. And I think that he's live to finish anybody. I mean, he's an absolute bona fide fight finisher. He's only gone to a decision three times out of his 19 victories. He's finished 16 of his 19 victories. So there's the threat of him getting the finish against anybody. And I'm going to pick Rebecki to get the victory here. How about that? I'm going to pick him. Um, th this is a close fight, but the fact that you throw that plus 225 next to his name, I think it just, you guys push me to pick him to win the fight. And uh, this is a, a spot where I could see the dog barking all day. Very excited for this fight. And give me Rebecki to win. This is a tough part too, because I could see him getting a knockout here. We know that Oral Bay's never been finished. He's only took one, one loss. Uh, years ago, it was a decision loss against a fighter that's still undefeated. Go check that that dude out. He looks like he may be a promising fighter as well. But Rebecki, like I said, he can finish anybody. So I'm going to say he gets the finish. How about that? I'm going to say he gets a TKO finish. That's a little bit of a wild predict prediction, but let's shake things up here. I'm going to say he gets a TKO finish.
We have two fight finishers here in the light heavyweight division uh, set to square off. And you guys already know the light heavyweight division is a division that tends to produce finishes. So I think I'm smelling something like that uh, that's going to take place. We have the UFC debut of Rafael Cerqueira. He's taken on Ebo Aslan. Uh, Ebo is a fighter that came from Dana White's contender series, had a, a quick victory over Paulo Hanato Jr., he followed that up with a UFC debut victory over Anton Turkali, who had a victory over him back in 2020. Uh, Anton had the submission victory there. So that was a, a big victory for him. Got some redemption there. And what, what really impressed me with that victory was the fact that he went to the third round to get that KO finish, landed a big shot. I think he was down on the scorecards, if you guys remember, going into that third round. But it was impressive because he's a fighter that doesn't have a lot of late round experience. And the first time they fought, it was actually his conditioning and cardio that kind of caught up to him in those grappling scenarios where he was broken down in the second round and subbed. So the fact that he pushed to the third round and got a TKO uh, finish I, I thought, or a knockout finish there, I thought that that was pretty impressive. It shows the development uh, that that's going on with him. He's 28 years old and uh, he, he's a danger striker, okay? Fighting lower level fighters early on in his career uh, for the most part, but that's definitely the same for his opponent here, Rafael Cerqueda. A lot of low, low level victories for Rafael over uh, taking place over in Brazil in the regional scene. He's been fighting in this promotion called uh, Demo Fight, if you guys are familiar with it. And trust me when I tell you guys, if you take a look at the opposition, it's very low level. Uh, he's a fighter that's making his UFC debut at an older age too. He's uh, 34 years old. I do believe he's 34 years old. We don't have the age listed here, but digging around, I think he is 34 years old. He's a fighter that trains at a lower level gym in Brazil. Uh, I think the name of the gym is Galpo da Lata. Trains with fighters like Jelton Almeida and Eduardo Mora. Those are the only two fighters that are in the UFC from that gym. So compared to some of the big name gyms in Brazil, obviously it's it's at the bottom of the totem pole there. And listen, how do I see this fight playing out? I definitely could see either man getting a knockout. I think it's one of those types of fights, two big dudes slinging it. And Rafael has shown that he can go out there and get his knockouts on the lower level regional scene. Eight knockouts out of his 11 victories. Snuck in a couple subs as well. Maybe that's something to keep an eye on. But like we said, Aslan showing development there. Was able to avoid that situation in the rematch with Turkali. I think that he could avoid that situation here. And when you break down tape on Rafael, he's a fighter that leaves his chin up there at times. He does take some shots. He has looked to be durable. I'll give him that. Even though he's eating those shots, he's never been finished. And, but he does get tagged a little bit. And I think that that's dangerous when you're in there with a, a, a step up in competition. I can see that knockout coming either way, but I favor it to come from the Aslan side. And another thing I like for Aslan is the fact that he has his feet wet in the octagon already, has that UFC debut victory already under his belt. And just he's a younger fighter that I think is going to start showing more growth. And he just has a higher ceiling at this point in time. I think he's the fighter that most likely gets the knockout. But even if it goes to the judges' scorecards, He's the fighter that's pushing the pace a little bit and not voluming uh, Cerqueda there. So I will take the already established Ebo Aslan, a fighter that we've seen perform uh, in the octagon before. All right, so you take a look at the betting line. Like I said, it's a very close one. Depending on what book you're looking at, you're basically seeing Aslan at right around a minus 120. Maybe you can get even odds on the UFC newcomer in Cerqueda. I'll take Aslan to get the job done. And uh, I would say that there's possibly some value on that fight. But there's, there's some question marks going on there. You guys know how these types of fights go. I mean, this is one where we don't completely have your, our finger on it. Okay, You really can't. You, you, you got to see how Cerqueda looks with this step up in competition. And at the very end of the day, two big boys slinging it. In the middleweight division, we got Abbas Megamedov taking on Bruno Fajera. Bruno Fajera, the Hulk, this is a fighter that has quickly become one of the most entertaining fighters in the UFC. I really believe that. I mean, this fighter, he's going out there. He's knocking dudes out left and right in the first round. And uh, if he takes an L, he's, he's going out on his shield too, right? He did get caught with that one knockout loss in the first round against Nurse Sultan Rosaboyov. Uh, but besides that, first round knockouts over Gregory Rodriguez, Phil Haas, and Dustin Stolzfus. And the Dustin Stolzfus knockout, that was the impressive one, right? Because he went through adversity in that fight. He took a lot of damage. He never looked for a way out. And eventually he gets the knockout with just nine seconds left in that first round and uh, yeah you could have question marks uh, about him in regards to the fact that he's only left the first round one time and the time or excuse me only left the first round two times then in those two fights he gets the knockout within seconds of the second round so yeah there's some question marks about how he's going to look late in fights but 
I think that the signs that he showed towards the end of that first round kind of hint at him being a fighter that will dig deep as long as the fight goes. I kind of have confidence in him looking decent there. And we just recently had the same type of thoughts about Mega Madoff after that Strickland fight where he came out hot in the first round and completely broke down in the second round. So he he's a fighter that we're like, uh, what is, is his conditioning like? It, it seems to be lower level, even though he has a longer track record of going late in fights. There was still that question mark about him, uh, but you have to like the way that he bounced back to an extent in the next two fights. I know he takes an L against Kyo there, but did go to the third round, wasn't finished there. And then in that fight against Worley Alves, he pushed the pace all throughout that fight, changing levels and just going to work. So he he's shown signs of, of digging deep uh, later in fights. And I don't think that there's that big of a question mark about him there. Although he is 34 years old, uh, well, Bruno is the more prime fighter here. I would say that Magomedov shows to have more paths to victory in this matchup. If it goes to the later rounds, you probably have to favor it being Magomedov having success late in this fight, changing levels, maybe using his grappling uh, to, to score points and uh, maybe even outpointing Fajeda late, just being the fresher fighter because we, we haven't seen Fajeda perform in those later rounds. So you, you got to kind of lean Magomedov's way there. As far as somebody getting a knockout early in this fight, we've seen Magomedov go out there and get big KOs early in the octagon as well, right? Let's also remember in his UFC debut, went out there and starched Dustin Stolzfus in just 19 seconds, right? He put it on him within just 19 seconds, a common opponent of Fajera. And, and also you could have some question marks based on the fact that Fajera took a lot of damage against Stolzfus early in that fight, right? So you kind of got some question marks about him there. I'll tell you this though, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you guys a curveball here. I'm going to go with my instincts and my gut with this prediction here. I'm not going to, just lean towards the the more likely or the more possible outcomes. I'm going to say that the outcome that happens here is that Fajera just proves to be a dog once again. And I think that he gets a knockout in this fight. I think that he weathers the storm from Abbas with, with, with whatever offensive output that Abbas throws towards his way. Now, Bruno was knocked out in that one fight, but I think that overall he's still a durable fighter. I think he weathers the storm there. And I think this fight gets ugly. And I could actually see him breaking down Magomedov like Magomedov was broken down against Sean Strickland. Okay. I, I could see that scenario happening. And for some reason, I think that that's what's going to happen. So I'm taking the Hulk here to get the job done. I think he gets another knockout, man. Uh, he has had nine knockout victories out of his, his 12 wins there. A couple subs as well, but make no mistake. It's the knockout that's the threat when you step in there with, with Bruno. So uh, right now, Bruno is right around a plus 110 underdog. He's a slight underdog. And my gut is telling me that he rises to the occasion here. And he he, he digs deep and he gets a knockout victory. Uh, and if it goes to the judges' scorecards, I'd be very intrigued to see how this fight plays out. But my gut also tells me that Bruno will be a fighter that will look fresher in the later rounds than a lot of us may think, right? Because he's never been there. But I think that he's actually proves to be a fighter that's game. I liked what I saw in that last fight, man, when he went through adversity late in the first round. This fight is taking place in the welterweight division. We have the number 13th ranked lightweight, the former champion in the lightweight division, Rafael Dos Anjos, RDA. He's taking on the number 10th ranked welterweight fighter here in Jeff Neal, who comes into this fight on a two-fight losing skid. But if you dive into those two fights, you got to be somewhat impressed with the performances. He went to a split decision against Ian Gary, although Gary clearly won that fight. I mean, that, that was ridiculous that it went to a split. Uh, just a, another example of, of how inadequate the judges are. But you still had to give him respect in the sense that he had some moments in that fight. And he actually had one of the more competitive fights against Gary that we've seen uh, over the last couple of years. So you give him a little bit of credit there. Uh, the fight against Shavkat Rachmanov, he ended up getting finished in the third round. But early on, he just he, he showed that he's not a complete pushover, okay? And then that's fighting a very high-level fighter, a fighter in Shavkat that's fighting for the belt against your favorite fighter, Bilal Muhammad, in the near future. Uh, before that, he had a KO victory against Vicente Luque, a common opponent of RDA. RDA just got grinded out and wrestled uh, by the shell of Vicente Luque. That was a little weird. And then before that, Gar um, excuse me, before that, uh, Jeff Neal had a victory over Santiago Ponzinibbio. Uh, we'll stop that there, but just... Just note, man, RDA is 39 years old, and I'll just circle back to that Vicente Luque loss, which really was a bad one. It was one of those vintage performances when RDA is losing where he's getting out grappled, and Vicente Luque was never a fighter that went out there and did that. He was always a striking-based fighter, so I understand that Luque has skills there. He's a well-rounded fighter, but that was a bad look. That was a bad look for RDA, and then he goes out there, he takes an L against Mateusz Gamrat. Well, take that for what you will, but just the fact that he's 39 years old, 
it, it's it's looking to me like you're going to start to see RDA really start to fall off a cliff. And he's a fighter that's held on to his fighting ability late in his career, especially for the lower weight classes or for being in the lower weight classes, fighting in the lightweight division. Uh, he's such a game fighter, takes good care of himself. He's just a, a gladiator of the game. But I think that we're going to see, see him start to take a, a deep dive off the cliff here. And when you go in there with a younger fighter like Jeff Neal, who's not extremely young, I think he's 34 years old, but he has a lot more left to give the sport. He's a lot hungrier than RDA, in my opinion, coming off these two losses, understanding that he still has time to try to make some noise in, in the game, while RDA may start to be accepting the fact that he's at the end of the game. So uh, I, I will take Jeff Neal. Uh, Jeff Neal almost landing five strikes per minute compared to RDA's 3.48. Jeff Neal has been very aggressive on the feet. It starts with the boxing skills that he possesses. He's dangerous there. He has fight-ending power. Uh, he does absorb more strikes than RDA. RDA has been a little bit more polished defensively, but I, I think the offense of Jeff Neal will be on display. Wouldn't even be surprised if, if Jeff Neal uh, keeps RDA honest by changing levels a little bit here and there. I don't know how much success he'll have there, but still, uh, Jeff Neal's an athlete, and maybe he just kind of changes levels to keep RDA guessing a little bit. And uh, at the end of the day, though, it's the striking where I see Jeff Neal having success. And uh, Neal with nine knockouts out of his 15 victories. He's always live to get a knockout. RDA has been finished four times there out of his 16 losses with the vast majority coming by way of decision. I'm going to say that RDA digs deep and makes it to the final bell, but Jeff Neal is a step above and, and just he outlands RDA. He lands the more damaging shots and all that. So uh, give me Jeff Neal to get the job done. And Jeff Neal is a hefty minus 275 favorite. That line hasn't moved uh, thus far. And um, that's that's possibly a little bit of a steep line for my liking. Got to put a little bit of respect on RDA's name. If he's able to pause the clock here and he put in a crazy fight camp, maybe he shows up and he's the more well-rounded fighter and it's a close one. I don't like the value on Jeff Neal's name, but I do believe that he wins a decision. Here he is, the one-eyed Shara, the bullet Magomedov. He's taking on Armand Petrosian. Uh, this is without a doubt a striker's delight. Striker versus striker here. Both fighters have really shown to be inadequate down at the uh, down on the mat at times armin petrosian comes into this fight uh, off a submission loss uh, against the very high level rodolfo Vieira, but just uh, completely fell right right down to the mat there and just didn't show any signs of working on his footwork and his takedown defense um shara megamedov he may be showing some signs of development in that part of his game but really hasn't been tested recent victories he's had were over miha oleg Seishak, antonio trick chocoli bruno silva uh, so far in the UFC, he is 3-0. And, oh, and uh, you know, none of those fighters I just listed are really high-level grapplers. So, yeah, I mean, I don't believe he's been tested there. But I don't expect Armand Petrosian to really test him there. Like I said, this is a striker's delight. I expect these two fighters to trade on the feet. And this is a high-level high striking match. And it's this is a fun fight. I believe the fact that neither fighter has to worry about that grappling-oriented attack coming their way favors Magomedov. And I'll tell you why. Uh, if this fight does go to the judges' scorecards, I think that there is a solid advantage for Magomedov having the crowd behind him and just being a household name in that part of the world. Uh, besides that, I mean, he this is a fighter in his first three fights in the octagon has landed 6.88 strikes per minute. He pushes a crazy pace, so he'll be landing throughout the fight there. Um, the one thing he has to worry about, of course, is getting clipped with, with the counter shot or uh, not even a counter shot, just if, if Petrosian pushes the pace in the feet and he lands something big, uh, people kind of wonder the, with the fact that Megamedov only has one eye, how is his defense on that, that one side of his face there? Maybe Petrosian can be the fighter that capitalizes on that. He may be the highest level striker that Megamedov has has faced thus far. So that, that is something you have to be careful there. Uh, Petrosian is a fighter that can hurt you there. In, in just eight professional fights, he has five KOs and uh, came into MMA with that kickboxing background. So we will mention that, okay? That is a realistic threat. We may see Petrosian go out here and, and have success with his striking and land a big shot. But I still will say, if the fight goes to the judges' scorecards, it favors Megamedov. And I could even see Megamedov potentially getting a knockout of his own. I mean, this is a fighter that has knocked out every single fighter that he's been in there with. He has eventually found the finish in all 14 of his victories. The dude is very tough, seems to be very durable as well. He could take a shot. Because even though he's had a lot of success offensively, we've actually seen him touched up a little bit in some of his fights. And some of those fights that got that got sticky, we've seen him touched up a little bit. So that's the question mark there. All in all, though, I'm siding with Maga Madoff over there in Abu Dhabi. Dude, he's something else, this guy. And uh, stylistically, this is a fight. You don't have to worry about him getting taken down. If the UFC matches him up with somebody that has some serious wrestling, I think he's going to get exploited. I'll, I'll tell you guys that right now. I know he's working on that part of his game, but 
right now, he's going to get exploited down there if you throw him in there with a the high level grappler. But uh, that's not the case here. And uh, that's not to say that you never know what, what could happen. It's the fight game. Maybe Petrosian's been sharpening up that, that aspect of his game and you see him mixing some takedowns. You guys know how these fights go. You never know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but right now, with what we have to work with, I, I like Megamedov to win this fight via decision. A Petrosian, although he's been knocked out once before, he's shown to be very durable in the octagon. He went to war with Gregory Rodriguez, took a lot of damage in that fight, uh, never showed any, any signs of wilting in there. And I'm going to say... This is a fight that he can survive that pace of Mega Madoffs. It may get ugly, may get ugly in there for him, but I say it goes to a decision. Give me the bullet to win via decision. Here we go. We got the very primed 32-year-old future champion of the division in Magomed and Kalayev. Currently ranked two, but I think he is uh, set to be the C. He's taking on Alexander Rakic, currently the number fifth ranked light heavyweight fighter who's on a two-fight losing skid. But you do have to understand that he got injured in that fight against Jan Blakovic, even though he was losing the beginning of that fight and probably was en route to losing regardless of the leg injury. And then he goes out there in his comeback fight against Yuri Prohaska and has early success uh, as Yuri is there to be hit. And he was touching him up, but then he broke down in that fight. He gets finished in the second round. That was one of the most exhilarating and exciting fights that I've seen in a long time. I love that fight. I was at the bar. We were going crazy. You guys know I made some money on that fight too, but... Um, and I, I have respect for Rakic, but let, let me be honest. Rakic is a fighter that's never really lived up to the hype that he once had, right? Came in to the UFC, uh, had a victory over Barroso, but then he followed it up with a performance where he dismantled Justin Ledet. Ledet was that, that boxing heavy fighter who was heavy on that lead leg and Rakic was chopping him down. Everybody caught wind of who he was in that fight and then followed up with two huge knockouts over Devin Clark and Jimmy Manoa, just flatlining those fighters there. And he had all this hype behind him. And then since then, it's, it just hasn't really gone well. Um, lost to Vulcan. And then even the victories he was getting inside the UFC after that were, were kind of lackluster decision victories over like Anthony Smith, Tiago Santos. And then we talked about the last two fights. I, I just feel that he lost a lot of momentum. And now coming off that loss that he just had and then getting thrown in there with the fighter of the caliber of an Ankalaev, that's a problem. Okay, that's a major problem for Rakic. Because what a lot of you guys don't realize is, for all you Anka Live haters, so I'll get on the mic right now. It's a little hot. I'm going to get on it right here for a second. A lot of you guys don't realize is that Anka Live is not some boring f fighter that uses his grappling to just sneak out decisions. I mean, this is a fighter that has 61% of his victories via knockout. Okay, he's gone out there and he is absolutely destroyed and ran through fighters. You saw what he did to Anthony Smith not too long ago. Uh, smashed him up. I mean, basically knocked out Johnny Walker two times in a row as he comes into this fight. The performance that he had against Ian Kutilaba uh, two times in a row, there was a little bit of controversy there in the first one, but make no mistake, that was another fight where he was getting the knockout regardless Or in that first fight. Uh, the knockout he had over Dolce Lingambula, that was one that, that really stood out to me, that front kick, just showing diversity in the striking. And then, yes, at the end of the day, he can mix in the grappling. He's the most complete fighter, fights out of the southpaw stance. He gives guys problems there. and. Listen, the elephant in the room, for those of you guys that are going to try to throw it there, he went to a draw with Jan Blakovich. I had him winning that fight, and at the very end of the day, Jan Blakovich is a very high-level fighter. That was a weird one. I still thought that he did enough to get the job done in that fight. Uh, yeah, he got his legs chewed up a little bit, but uh, he, he he still prevailed in that fight, and he should have been the champion of the world, and he should still be defending his belt. So I love me some Alex Pajera, but Magomed Ankalaev is going to he's going to smash him. He's going to be able to change levels. He's going to be the more complete mixed martial artist. Yes, There'll be a possibility that he'll get caught with the shot. Pajera is as good as it comes offensively with the striking. But you're, if you're talking about who's the more complete fighter, and Ankalaev can actually touch Pajera up too. Pajera is shown to be vulnerable to being touched a little bit. Don't sleep on the power and the fight ending ability Ankalaev has there. And Ankalaev is not easy to touch, only absorbing 2.25 strikes per minute uh, while putting out 3.64. I'm just, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm already looking forward to that fight, but I think you guys know which way I'm going with this. I think Ankalaev gets Rakic out of there, puts another... Uh, knockout victory under his belt which will be huge as he tries to make the push for the ufc to finally give him that title shot which he's been deserving uh, of a, for a while he's a minus 375 here i have no problem with that line i think that he realistically is like a minus 450 and i know this is a light heavyweight bout with Rakic having big power coming back towards his way but no and is he fights very intelligent in there that's the thing i didn't even talk about his iq is very high okay and if you're wondering why 
I'm going off and I've been going off about Ankle Live is because he's one of my favorite fighters in this division. He's put a lot of money in my pocket and I love watching excellence. I really do. And it's he's not just a boring fighter. That's the thing, right? So some of these fighters, like, like a Khabib or whatnot, maybe I'm ruffling some of you guys the wrong way, but like Khabib never did it for me. I still admired the greatness there. You know, I'm a guy that's a Miami Dolphins fan, but has a signed poster up in my office right over here of Tom Brady because I admire the greatness and what he did coming over to Tampa Bay late in his career. It's just, it's so admirable. I love watching uh, superior uh, talent uh, perform in sports and Enka Live is that for me. And he's a fighter that's still entertaining as well. So he gets knockouts and you guys will see what time to come. He's going to be the guy. So comment below. Do you guys disagree? Do you agree with me? I, I want to know what your guys' thoughts are there. But Ankalaev runs through. Rakic gets another big victory under his belt. And he fights for the belt. In the featherweight division, we have the still undefeated number 12th ranked featherweight, Lerone Murphy, taking on the number 14th ranked Dan Ige. Dan Ige comes into this fight off one of the more polarizing performances. Took that fight on hours, short notice against Diego Lopez, made it competitive. It was one of the more competitive fights we've seen Lopez in because Lopez is just going out there dismantling everybody. And that was a big feather in the cap of Ige. That was a win. That was a win at the end of the day. Before that, he knocked out Andre Feely in devastating fashion. Uh, now, he was grinded out against Bryce Mitchell before that uh, with the wrestling attack that Mitchell push, pushed on him. Uh, but this is not that type of fight. I don't expect Murphy to really have success or even look to go that avenue. He's more of an athlete and, and striking fighter first. Uh, so I think that this is a fight that kind of favors Ige stylistically compared to some of the, the fights where we've seen him take L's before. And even though you may look at Leroy Murphy and be like, oh, he's still an undefeated fighter that's having a lot of success in the UFC throughout the years, his time's coming. I don't know if that's really the case. You take a look at the Gabriel Santos fight. That was a fight that I clearly had him losing. He lost that fight against the very young uh, fighter that was making his debut in that fight and, and was just very green. And, and that, that wasn't the best performance by Murphy, if you ask me. Bounced back with two victories in a row over Koulibau and Barbosa. Barbosa's getting up there in age. And before that, I mean, I don't want to really say that his resume is not the best. He did what he should have did against Americani, got the knockout. You could put some respect on the Ricardo Ramos and Douglas Silva D'Andrade victories and came into the UFC and pushed a draw against Tukigov, who used to be a fighter that people were kind of, uh, they feared to go in there against him in the sense that uh, not necessarily what he would do offensively to you, but just he was such a hard fighter to get a W against. It's like when you were matched up against him, you were, you were typically going to take an L, especially in your debut against a fighter that was more proven. And that was a fight that took place, I think, in Abu Dhabi. So he really had his back up against the wall. And yes, it did. That was UFC 242, Khabib versus Poirier. So big time performance there in his debut. But you know what, man? I think that Ige will have the ability to land some big strikes in this fight as they trade. And so will Murphy. Murphy will have those opportunities too. And Murphy may be a little bit quicker in there and whatnot, but Ige has some serious pop, some serious power. I think that Ige actually may be the more well-rounded fighter here. And I'm going to take the dog. I'm going to take the dog here in the co co main event here. I, I just, I like the momentum that Ige brings into this fight off that last performance. We talked about him having the full training camp for, for this fight here, or at least a lot more lengthy training camp compared to the last fight. And I think he builds off that momentum. And I think that he gives he gives Murphy the churro, as Max Holloway likes to say, which we'll be talking about him in a little bit. But hands on that churro, turns that donut into a churro. I'm going to roll with the dog here. I'm going to take Dan Ige, who's currently a plus 160 underdog. I think there's some value on that line as well. I think this fight's really much closer than that. I think this fight should be more around pick em odds. Uh, Dan, Dan, Dan Ige is a problem. And he has grappling too. He has some solid BJJ. Uh, if you take a look at what he's done in, in uh, his professional career, 18 victories. Uh, four of them coming by way of sub, with six of them coming by way of knockout. Uh, so the finish is almost almost even there. A uh, good amount of decision victories as well. So if it goes to the judges' scorecards, he can do enough to get the job done there as well. Give me Dan Ige to win this fight. I, I really almost want to say knockout, man. He, he throws those heavy hooks. I think he can win this fight via knockout. I'm going to say he wins it, though, via decision. Here we go. Major implications for the future of the middleweight division. Remember I told you guys, if the winner of this fight goes out there and lands a spectacular finish, they may find themselves fighting against Strickland Duplessis next. I'm telling you guys, I think that they have the potential to surpass Strickland if you even believe he's the one next in line, which is, it's hard to say he's not really the next one in the line as of right now. A lot of people thought that he already beat DDP and he just had a victory over Costa. But when you take a look at the fact that Whitaker is an ex-champ himself, he's still 33. He's got some prime years left right now. Uh, he just had a, a beautiful finish over Ikram Alice Kirov in a fight that he had a, a short notice 
uh, replacement in Alice Kirov when he was supposed to be fighting Chimaev that, that first time around. Before that, had a victory over Costa. You could argue that that was a more impressive victory than the victory Strickland had over Costa as Strickland was just on the back foot, just outpointing him there. And, uh, you know, we love Strickland's personality, but it's been the talk of the town. He needs to go out there and start to look to get more finishes in his fights. As of recently, he hasn't been that type of fighter, unfortunately. And I'm a Strickland guy, okay? Uh, and before that, it was the loss against Duplessis. So it would be a rematch, uh, but the Strickland fight against Duplessis would be a rematch as well, even though Strickland probably won that fight. That's the catch there. And I'll say this too. If Chemaev goes out here and gets that big win, he could possibly be fighting for the belt. He's a polarizing name. He's still undefeated. But the UFC would have to have some faith in him that he's going to make the walk because he's a fighter that constantly has issues uh, health-wise. Uh, he's a fighter that's missed weight before. But again, now this is in the middleweight division. This is in the welterweight division. So that shouldn't be as much of a problem. So if he can go out here and do something spectacular, it's not out of the realm, but the UFC does have to get some faith in him. He's coming off victories over Kamaru Usman, Kevin Holland, Gilbert Burns, uh, and then leading to that that uh, fight where he made quick work of the leech, tossed him around the cage there. Those are some of the uh, more notable victories as of recently. But really, I mean, how, how do you skip over the Gerald Mearshart uh, right cross that he landed within seconds in that fight? That was crazy too. That was four years ago. Chemayev is the real deal. Uh, he's a solid fighter, but... As he fights some of these fighters at the top of the division, will he start to come up a little short, right? Against Kamar Usman, who took that fight on short notice, Chemayev was starting to slow down, man. He was he lost the third round, right? He was starting to slow down, and if that fight was a five-round fight, he probably loses it. And then also the Gilbert Burns fight, I was there for that live that took place in Jacksonville. I actually saw Chemayev in the hotel, man. I, I saw him in the hotel right outside the arena, and you want to talk about a bootleg uh, situation for fights. I mean, I'll just say it right now. Jacksonville is, is a complete hole. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you got the, the county jail looking right over the stadium there. You, you got the hotel. The jail is right next to the hotel. I mean, that little island that they had the fights on in Jacksonville. Jacksonville is just, uh, let me not even go there. But, you know, I saw Kamzat Shemaev in the lobby. He was with his boys. And, you know, I was already getting rowdy. I was getting the, the, the day started. And I just kind of was giving him a little, hey, let's go. You know, I had a big play in him. And, he was having none of it. Him and his team completely shut that down. They kind of waved me off. They said, hey, get out of here. So they're not the most friendly guys. They're more of those serious type of discipline type guys. You know, he may act wild. And maybe that was the beginning of me starting to not be the biggest fan of Chimaev, which if you guys have been following me for a while, you know I was a big fan of Chimaev's as he kicked his UFC career off. Maybe that had a little something to do with it because I'm not, I'm not really on his side these days. I'll tell you the truth, uh, depending on the matchup and whatnot. But I feel that he's changed as a fighter also. He's kind of lost that that edge when he's in the cage man he used to grab the mic saying i'm gonna get everybody i'm gonna do this and that you guys remember and now nothing's wrong with it but he's talking more about like life philosophy on the mic and he just doesn't show up enough i don't like the inactivity that he's had you remember when he burst on the scene and he fought uh what was it he fought within weeks right he fought within 10 days the submission victory over john phillips that led to the knockout over he's mckee or I, I call him he's mckee it was a rice mckee right whatever you want to call him i know some of you guys get upset with the pronunciation there but i call him he's mckee i think that's the wrong pronunciation but mckee okay when he had those two victories in a row he's, he's such an active fighter and even he followed th those victories up fighting two months later against Ger gerald mearshart and then he disappears from the fight game and i think that does point to something mentally going on with him and, and health wise and uh besides that as he fought fighters that were up a level he hasn't had the, the best performances and I don't know, man. I'm not the biggest fan of him these days. I'm more of a, of a Whitaker guy. I've always really respected what Whitaker brings to the table. And, and stylistically, Whitaker has all the abilities to hand Shumayev that first loss. Standing, I think that Whitaker is the more dangerous striker. And specifically, as the fight progresses, that's where he really will get the better of Shumayev. Shumayev has his own threat early on. He has good power and whatnot. But he, he slows down as the fight goes. Uh, he, he'll look to push with his grappling. Man, Whitaker is a fighter that has very polished wrestling. Not a lot of people realize he had a solid wrestling background coming out of uh, Australia, fighting out of Australia, which is not a place that's known for producing wrestlers, but he, he's been training wrestling from a young age. So he's polished there. He could do it all. He could stifle the attack of Chimaev when Chimaev pushes early with that grappling pace. It's not going to play out like the fight that Chimaev had against Kevin Holland, where he just ragdolls and rips him around and pulls off a sub. And Whitaker will defend all that. He'll push this fight to the later rounds. It'll, it'll probably play out similar to the Chimaya versus Burns fight. And I just think that Whitaker is a way more dangerous fighter than a Gilbert Burns. Okay. Gilbert Burns, I think even, I hate to say, it, I think Gilbert Burns has been a little bit of an overrated fighter at times. Tough dude, whatever, but uh, polished, well-rounded fighter, but Whitaker is a step above man. Okay. 
He's he's a legit middleweight, former middleweight champion of the world. He's a larger man. And Whitaker has all the makings to make this an ugly fight for Chimaev. And I think that Whitaker is going to get the job done here. And there's a variety of ways he could do it. Remember now, this is a five-round fight. And if Chimaev starts to slow down like he did in the third round against Usman, Whitaker can take this fight over and get a late TKO. Also early on, when you trade with Whitaker, we've seen this from way back in the day when he was on the Ultimate Fighter, when he was just a green, raw type of fighter. He always had that fight ending ability. He has serious zip and pop on his strikes. He could start you. Okay, we just saw him do that to Alice Kirov. He has kind of a funky style too, man. He's, he's up and down. He's floating in there. He'll hit, he'll wing something. He'll clip you. He'll put you out. He can knock Kamzat Shumayev in this fight, okay? So he can get the early finish or the late finish in this fight. And I think that he's just the fighter that that's thriving in the later rounds anyway. So um, I am taking the Reaper, Bobby Knuckles, Robert Whitaker, to not only get the job done, Give me Robert Whitaker to get a finish in this fight. Why not? Handle my lightweight, Robert Whitaker, because I am not happy with the way she might have handled me in the lobby of that hotel. And uh, guys, I am joking. And, and obviously that has no merit on the pick here, man. Strictly, this is, this is a pick based off of what I'm seeing on tape and, and just diving into this fight. And you guys that follow me on IG at MMA Fortune Teller underscore, you guys have known that I've been on the Whitaker side. And even some of you guys that tune into my lives have already previewed this fight. And I'm on Whitaker here and the value on him is on him all day at plus 165. This is a fight where I have it capped with Whitaker being about a minus 135, minus 140 favorite. I'm serious about that, man. That's where I have this fight capped. We'll see how it plays out. I'm going over everything, man. Whitaker is a proven fighter, has a lot more left to offer the fight game. He's arguably in his prime right now. His confidence is back. He knows he made a mistake in that, that fight with Jerkis Duplessis. Maybe overlooked him a little bit and it cost him. And now he's motivated and he's looking to make one more run at this, this belt. And He's a very cerebral fighter. Give me Bobby Knuckles to get that, to get a late finish in this fight. Here she is. We got the main event set to take place. It's for the featherweight championship of the world. Ilya Taporia will be facing off with the future Hall of Famer, Max Holloway. Uh, Taporia, of course, the champion. Holloway currently ranked number two in this featherweight division. He's also ranked number eight up in the lightweight division. Uh, dating back to 2019, he had a couple of fights up there. Uh, most recently, he had a fight with this dude named uh, Justin Gaethje. Maybe some of you guys caught that fight. Had a knockout with just one second left to go in it. Uh, but before that, was putting on a master class against Gaethje, who came into that fight with a lot of momentum after he had just knocked out Dustin Poirier. Uh, Max Holloway's most recent fight in the lightweight division before that was a fight actually against Dustin Poirier, uh, where he came up a little bit short. But listen, I could run you through Max Holloway's resume. We'll, we'll be here all night, okay? Because there, there's so many big names scattered all throughout it. If you take a look at the losses, it's only against the cream of the crop, right? The only losses that he's ever taken as a pro were against Alexander Volkanovsky, which the vast majority of us thought he won number two against Volkanovsky. I thought he won that rematch there, but still Volkanovsky, one of the goats of the game. He took two losses against Dustin Poirier. The first one was his UFC debut. He was just a young kid. That was back in 2012. That may seem like forever ago to some of you guys. It probably was before some of you guys were even fight fans. And you know, I was just cruising, man. I was already a fight fan long before that. So that was just when uh, we were on the couch and uh, we were looking at, at uh, you know, mama's leftovers in the fridge, just lounging on the, cr the couch there and whatnot. So um, you know, that, that was a cool fight too. And I remember watching that and being very impressed. And I, I've been a long time DP fan. So I was rooting for DP uh, as he came over from the WEC and handled Max Holloway. And early on, we saw Holloway struggle a little bit with his grappling because he also lost a fight to Conor McGregor. Where if you guys remember that fight, that was a fight where he was taken out multiple times and controlled down on the mat. And Conor McGregor had a torn ACL, I think MCL or ACL. His leg was destroyed and he still out grappled Holloway. So, you know, Holloway's came a long way. Now he's a fighter that has a very good takedown defense and it's not easy to get him down so listen i'm not even counting the dennis bermudez fight as a loss that was a split decision loss that i thought that holloway won i remember that fight very vividly that was back in 2013 but uh, just leave that that there and you you want to just run through some names real quick for fun i mean clay collard had the knockout over clay collard uh, submitted andre feely back in the day victories over cub swanson charles Oliveira. Jeremy Stevens, Anthony Pettis, Jose Aldo, two times in a row, Brian Ortega, Frankie Edgar, Calvin Cater, Yair Rodriguez, Arnold Allen, the Korean Zombie, Justin Gaethje. I mean, there's some big names scattered on Max Holloway's resume. He's the real deal. I'm a huge fan of his. Uh, sometimes I just tend to be on the opposite 
side of his just based on who he's fighting, right? He's, he's fighting these big names. He's fighting these fighters that I admire. And Ilya Taporia is one of those fighters. He's, he's creeping up on being my favorite fighter in the fight game right now. It's either him or Adricus Duplessis. I love the confidence that both these fighters ooze out of themselves. El Matador is him. I'm telling you guys, he is him. He has the cleanest boxing in the game. And just because Max Holloway looks like he's a little bit more rangy and longer, right? He comes in with that four inch height advantage. Don't forget that these men both have the same reach at 69 inches. So Taporia has those nice long arms to go with the frame he has there. Taporia is extremely well rounded. I already been talking about his boxing skills. Do understand when it comes to his grappling, he is very high level. And I think that he could have an advantage there. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a couple of takedowns uh, throughout this fight. You know, Holloway has came a long way there, but it's still hard to forget some of those performances where uh, the takedowns did, did cost him. And I know those were a long time ago, but Taporier is a tank of a fighter. He's well-rounded. Uh, we saw what he was doing to Bryce Mitchell down on the mat. Bryce Mitchell, a fighter that's known for pushing the pace and now grappling fighters that he's in there with. And uh, you mean you saw what Taporia did to him. Taporia eventually subs him down in the mat too, pulls off that arm triangle choke there. We've seen Taporia just throw him bombs down in the mat with, with nasty ground and pound uh, if he gets it there as well. But I think that this fight probably does take place on the feet uh, for the entirety of the fight. I wouldn't be surprised if both men look to just prove who the better striker is. I really hope that Taporia goes out there right off the rip and does what he said he was going to do uh, by pointing down to the mat as soon as the fight kicks off and and we see if Max Holloway will meet him there because I think Holloway will meet him there. If, if Taporia goes out and points down at the mat and says, let's trade right off the rip, I just couldn't see Holloway cower, cowering from that type of scenario. And if they trade like that, I'm going to let you guys know right now, it's not a 50-50. It's not a 50-50. I know we're typically seeing Holloway being the fighter that is just moving like he's in the matrix against fighters in those types of positions. He's like, he can't be touched and he's just tagging them up in those trading scenarios. That won't be the case with Taporia. I'm telling you right now, Taporia, Taporia will land on him. He is way more refined. He's way more crisp with his striking. The power is the real deal. And we may see Max Holloway get knocked out for the first time. We've never seen Holloway finished, right? I mean, he's been so durable. The dude is made of cinder blocks. We've seen him teed off on before in, in certain fights. He's just, he doesn't get finished, okay? He's actually only been finished once in his career, and that was that Poirier sub. Okay, so he is very hard to finish regardless of knockout or sub. But if there is a fighter that can do it, I'm telling you right now, it is Ilya Taporia. I think that Taporia is just going to be too good for, for Holloway. I think he's the more well-rounded fighter. Just 27 years old. We haven't even seen near the best of who Taporia is going to be. Imagine Taporia when he's in his prime at 30 years old after he's defended this belt multiple times. I mean, th this guy, remember now, we, we gave out a free play for him against Volkanovski. We were able to get him at plus odds. And if you guys are forgetting about those free official play videos, I mean, we, we hit like five in a row and like, Four of them were underdog picks. Taporia was an underdog pick. And uh, I mean, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get a line like that next to his name here because now everybody knows what he's about. Uh, we sniped that one against Volkanovski. But Taporia is the better fighter anywhere this fight goes. I don't question his cardio and conditioning like many do, which I understand that we haven't seen him that much late in fights. And Holloway is a fighter that's proven in those later rounds and he pushes a crazy pace. I mean, look at the numbers that the Holloway puts off to landing 7.17 strikes per minute. So if it does go to the later rounds, you kind of worry that Holloway's pushing that volume and can, can kind of drown Taporia there. I'm not, I'm not somebody that that's worrying about that as much. I think that Taporia is a phenomenal athlete. I think that he proves to be the real deal anywhere the fight goes. And I almost hope it goes to those later rounds so we could see that. Uh, but really, obviously I want to see that knockout. I want to see Taporia be the first person to ever start Holloway and it, typically that would be in the in the beginning rounds where he really has that pop on his strikes and I would love to see that as well and again don't take this the wrong way I'm a Holloway fan but I'm a bigger Taporia fan like he's probably my favorite fighter in the game right now man I love the confidence that he's pushing out there and I know some of you guys just don't like that 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 confidence that some of these fighters have they, it rubs you guys the wrong way um I kind of gravitate towards it I feel like if I was a fighter I would try to be a fighter like Taporia, I would thrive off myself and believe in myself. And I would like to intimidate other fighters by imposing my confidence on them. And that's yet to be seen if, if that's going to be the case with Holloway. Holloway is not a fighter that's easy to intimidate there. But when we saw them going back and forth in that little interview, you know, Holloway was just kind of quiet and just letting it just roll off him like it's water and, and he's a duck and just kind of letting it beat off him. But you kind of wonder, man, he, not a lot of people go out there 
and, and talk to Holloway like that, especially with the performance Holloway just had. And I think Holloway recognizes there's a reason why Taporia is so confident and he's slick on the mic, man. I don't know. I'm, I'm impressed with this dude. I got Taporia winning this fight. I think he gets the knockout. I think he's the first ever fighter to knock out Max Holloway. Telling you guys right now, I think that's what's going to happen in there. Uh, he was once upon a time a minus 170. He's now a minus 250. It's funny because I was doing some posts on IG and people were telling me, uh, yeah, you'll see Holloway's going to expose him and this and that. And it seems like the betting line, at least, you know, the masses are coming over to the Taporia side big time. Everyone's on Taporia here now. He's becoming a, a big time favorite. Maybe I'm going to say that that line settles. Might even, go, might even go back the other way. The closer we get to the fight, I expect that line to come back. I think that you'll be able to get Saporia again, right around minus 200, two to one as a two to one favorite. I think that line will come back. All right. He's hyped up right now. The stock's going up, but the closer we get to the fight, people are going to remember what Holloway is about as well. They're going to remember that last fight against Gaethje. They're going to have question marks of how Taporia is going to look in the fourth and fifth round. And um, so if you're looking to get Taporia, maybe you sit, sit back right now and wait for that line to come back. But I got Ilya Taporia getting the knockout. Maybe we'll talk about that, that prop bet on the prop edition video. And I'm going to be going crazy for that fight. I'm going to be going crazy, guys. And uh, I know you guys will as well. All right, guys, that's going to wrap up UFC 308. This one's been fun for me. Maybe I was a little long-winded on the mic. I enjoyed myself here. I had a little coffee while we were talking about these fights. And I'm, I'm super excited for almost every bout uh, on this card. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to do the fight companion if anybody had any question marks there. I don't think I will be able to do, to do the fight companion. I got a little something going on for the fights, a little red carpet event. Maybe you see the teller on IG rocking a tuxedo coming out, uh, capitalizing, hitting huge bets, making it another profitable night. Maybe you see me dancing on Instagram, uh, as I like to do when we're cashing big on a big card like this. So uh, that's probably going to be the scenario there. But I hope you guys all profit on this, this card. Uh, if you want to work with me for my Fisher Plays, remember, guys, just reach out to me and I'll give you some information there. This is going to be a huge event for me. All right, guys. And, uh, Please hit that like button, subscribe if you're new to the channel, and I'll hit you guys with some parting words uh, for a card like this. Let's see. I mean, I'll keep it simple, guys, but simple but important. Make sure you guys are doing your own research uh, on everything you do with your life, whether it's what you put in your body, uh, decisions you make in a, in a vast majority of ways. If you guys can just use your imagination there, just use your brain. Don't expect anybody to have your best interests. Nobody has your best interest. Uh, maybe your parents do. But even then, it's your, your job to do your own research as well and double check what, what, they, what they're doing. Remember, they come from a different time. The world's constantly changing. You need, to have your, you need to do your due diligence to make sure you have the best interest for yourself there and make sure you're doing research and be skeptical and careful where you get your research from and trust your instincts at times as well and uh, make sure you guys are putting good things in your body and you're taking care of yourself and you'll notice that you'll feel better about yourself and you'll be a happy happier version of yourself. All right, guys, I'll leave you with that. Just make sure you're not sitting around relying on other people and other things to make you feel good or, or to make you happy in life. Because if you rely on other people and other types of things, they will not have your best interests and you will not be the best version of yourself. All right, guys, I'll leave you with that. And uh, of course, we can go deeper on that subject on uh, another closing thought segment. But uh, I'll leave you guys with that, man. We've been going. Make sure you're following me on Twitter and Instagram again, guys, because I'm going to be busy all fight week. I'll have a lot of videos coming out. I'm thinking about putting some really wild and creative type of content there, too. So thank you guys so much. Signing out. Teller. The Teller. The Teller. The Teller.